the Battle of Jutland, one of those great what-if moments in world history. Often target for some truly wacky scenarios. Replacing the German fleet with Bismarck clones, anyone? Or putting HMS Vanguard in? Or replacing the entire Grand Fleet with British World War II ships? It does have potential for fun stories to tell, though. That being said, perhaps less than some people would otherwise believe, taking into account everything about the battle. Even so, it is good for a short mini-scenario here, as I will now get into. The Battle of Jutland was the final climactic clash between the British Grand Fleet and the German High Seas Fleet. While other, smaller battles preceded it, and indeed would follow it, none quite match up to Jutland in scale. It was, and remains, the largest battle between gun-armed warships. The one and only great conflict between the Dreadnoughts and their battlecruiser cousins. It should be little surprise it is so heavily focused on for alternate histories. The battle itself, taking place well into the night, was a confused mess of an affair. British battlecruisers sparred with their German counterparts as destroyers tossed torpedoes in every imaginable direction. The British would suffer catastrophic losses of their ships due to poor powder handling. The infamous, something is wrong with our bloody ships today, moment. And no, I'm not going to try and butcher a British accent. The Germans themselves would have their battlecruisers heavily mauled to the point they lost one, Lutzow and almost lost another, Seidlitz. In the main clash between the fleets, the British would lose another battlecruiser, and the Germans would have Lutzow fatally wounded, among other damage to various ships. From the crippled war spite to the obliterated defense. The full and proper battle line conflict would end inconclusively, however. The German battleships take a pounding, the British battleships, save for the unfortunate war spite, take no damage but also fail to sink anything. This leads into a confusing night action, where various light forces, destroyers, and cruisers are sunk, as well as a very unfortunate German pre-dreadnought sunk by torpedo. In the end, the battle itself would be inconclusive. The British lost more, but they could afford to lose more. The Germans lost less, but what they didn't lose was out of action for months. Months that the Royal Navy spent commissioning yet more ships. And thus, we have our background. What if, though? In the initial battlecruiser action, one man made all the difference. One Major Francis Harvey. A Royal Marine fatally wounded when HMS Lion, Admiral Beatty's flagship, took a direct hit to her Q turret. Harvey, in spite of his wounds, ordered that the magazine of the turret be flooded and the doors closed. His actions arguably saved Lion as a later fire and explosion buckled her magazine doors but did not destroy the ship, as happened to her half-sister, Queen Mary. What if, though, every man in that turret was killed? What if Lion did blow up as catastrophically as the other British battlecruisers? Admiral Beatty almost certainly dies with his flagship. When Indefatigable and Queen Mary went up, almost none of their crew survived. Only 11 men between the two ships. With Lion destroyed in the opening minutes and Beatty with her, chaos reigns in the British formation. The bow cruisers likely continue on under their individual captains until someone can take overall command, almost certainly continuing on their previous orders. Beatty had trained his captains to do such, operate on their own initiative, so they likely would do so. However, 
it is equally likely that as the ships try and figure out what to do with their admiral dead or missing at absolute best, they continue on as they did historically, leading to, well, likely the same results. First one, then two, other bow cruisers destroyed. At this point, it becomes a question of if the British can restore a chain of command or if their formation just completely disintegrates in the chaos. The British have lost the Lion, Indefatigable, and Queen Mary, and I know I'm mispronouncing the second one. The other bow cruisers have all, save for New Zealand, the lucky sister, suffered some level of damage. By this point, it is fairly likely that Admiral Evans Thomas and the 5th Bow Squadron takes command. His battleships would have caught up with the bow cruisers and joined their formation, after being misled earlier on by poor signaling from Beatty. In the chaos of shifting the flag, it is entirely possible that another bow cruiser could be destroyed, or that the historical damage is increased. For the sake of this scenario, we shall say that Tiger, historically hit the hardest of the ones that didn't sink, is hit hard enough to be forced to withdraw from the battle. Princess Royal loses a turret akin to how Lion historically did, though she does survive. From here, as the German Admiral Scheer's battle fleet approaches, the British turn on their runs in the north, and the timelines converge again. Evans Thomas is likely to preserve his battleships from damage they historically took, as he has no further miscommunication from the very deceased Beatty. Even so, the now too strong bow cruiser formation would still outpace the battleships, and the confusion on Jellicoe's end is likely to remain. If anything, it's exacer exacerbated by the loss of Lion and the confusion to the south. Jellicoe, needing a firm position on the German fleet to deploy against it, would have only conflicting reports from survivors of the bow cruiser action until Evans Thomas could arrive. The slower battleships would take longer to reach the formation, even without the delays they suffered historically, and Jellicoe would be forced to act on his own initiative. As a cautious man, he likely delays just a little bit longer than historically, as the conflicting reports cause indecision on his end. This likely does little to change the material outcome of this phase of the battle, though the longer period of the so-called Windy Corner confusion almost certainly sees more ships on the edge of the formation come under fire by the Germans. Perhaps even a collision or two, though the British were able to avoid this historically, if barely. The next major change likely comes when HMS Warspite's rudder jams. With the German bow cruisers more intact, after all, less fire had been directed at them, more fire could be focused on the battleship. The hits she takes from the bow cruiser guns are not enough to sink her, as Evan Thomas did not have the same powder handling issues, and the turrets of the battleships are better armored at any rate. However, the increased fire from the bow cruisers, coupled with hits from the dreadnoughts she historically would suffer, likely leave Warspite a flaming wreck that could barely steam out of the combat zone. Whether she survives or not is an open question, though for now we will say she doesn't sink immediately. At this point, the second bow cruiser action takes place. The Germans are coming in, as previously mentioned, relatively fresher than historically. The British, however, are sharply limited to the damaged Princess Royal, the fresh, albeit old, New Zealand, and the third bow cruiser squadron. This likely does go mostly as it historically did, with Invincible sunk and the other bow cruisers escaping major damage. But where things are likely to differ is in the fate of Lutzow. With Lion no longer there, she receives less fire and can focus her own fire more. This holding true for the other bow cruisers as well. This allows them to take enough pressure off of Lutzow that she is heavily damaged, yet not crippled. At this point, with nothing 
really to make him change his mind, Shear likely makes the same maneuvers he historically made. The initial turn away, the second turn that brought them into conflict with the Grand Fleet, and arguably caused most of the damage the Germans would take in the battle. With the longer confusion in the British line, however, his vanguard battleships take less damage during the second clash with the Grand Fleet. The return fire from the Germans is still still hampered by poor positioning and the lack of visibility, so they do no significant damage in return. However, the death ride of Hipper's bow cruisers also goes according to plan. These ships take a pounding, yet suffer no losses as they distract the British battleships. The bow cruisers pull away in the gathering darkness, Sadlitz and Lutzow both barely afloat. But through heroic efforts of their crews, the two ships manage to slink away, albeit with great difficulty, while the other bow cruisers continue ahead. The next major change once more relates to the loss of Lion and the confusion it created in the British command system. Jellicoe's fleet, still not quite in perfect position, is exposed to the torpedo runs of the German torpedo boats. Historically, as it is, quite a few of those attacks came dangerously close to hitting the British ships. Here, in continuing with the theme of the Germans having the best probable case scenario, managed to hit three or four battleships. One of them, HMS Marlborough, already having been hit by a torpedo from a German cruiser, sinks in a catastrophic explosion all her own. The others, whichever ones you please here, it doesn't matter in the details, survive, though slowed heavily by the hits. Jellico, as already mentioned a cautious man, is very wary of further attacks, even more cautious than he was historically with the extra damage. He holds back on pursuing the Germans, including holding his bow cruisers back, wary of losing any more of his limited numbers. After all, by then he only has two, maybe three if New Zealand continues to escape damage, bow cruisers in any condition to try and move forward. The nighttime destroyer actions continue, though, as they did historically, up to and including the loss of the pre-dreadnought Pomern on the German side. However, the Germans managed to pull away in good order and return to port. The Battle of Jutland remains, as historically, an arguably inconclusive engagement. However, with the loss of Admiral Beatty, and Admiral Hood on Invincible, as well as the losses of Lion, Marlborough, the crippling of Tiger, the potential loss of Warspite, and the extra damage from the torpedo attack, one could conclusively argue that the Royal Navy did not win Jutland. One can make the argument, as historically, that they did not lose it, mind you. The Germans conceded the field, and the British would ultimately maintain their lead in warships. Even in the absolute worst-case scenario losses, the ships coming online would bring the British to the same number of warships as before Jutland, with arguably more modern and more powerful, with the exception of the courageous class, ships than those they had lost. For the Germans, they would retain Lutzow, and their battleships would take less damage. The disparity in numbers would remain, though. In comparison to the ships commissioned by the Royal Navy, the High Seas Fleet would gain only SMS Hindenburg and two Bayern-class battleships before the end of the war. While a convincing argument can be made that the Germans won the battle on a technical, uh, tactical level, it is still a divisive argument. They certainly caused much more damage to the Grand Fleet and its reputation. The loss of Lion and Beatty would throw the battle cruiser force into disarray for some time, even ignoring the repairs needed to Princess Royal and Tiger. Losing another dreadnought would, or two if Warspite sinks would also cause a large hit to the Royal Navy, if only a temporary one. 
However, the resources required to repair their damaged ships, and indeed the damage itself, that would still convince the German command to push for submarine warfare. They would still likely bring the Americans into the war, and that would still cause them to ultimately lose as the numbers were against them. Plainly speaking, even in this best-case scenario, the Germans lacked the firepower to cause mass losses to the Grand Fleet. Even if Scheer had maneuvered his ships better, it still wouldn't have been enough. Even if they somehow sank twice or even three times the number of capital ships they historically did, the almost inevitable entrance of the United States would make up for those losses. Even if, for some reason, the Americans stay out, the Royal Navy would soon commission five battleships with 15-inch with guns, the Revenge class, along with four more battle cruisers. Even if two of them were the aforementioned Courageous class that are questionable in utility as gunships. The Germans just don't have enough ships, and the Royal Navy, especially if they lost Jutland, would never allow itself to be drawn out piecemeal in the aftermath of the battle. Perhaps the best outcome they can hope the Germans can hope for is that Lutzow survives to join her sisters on the bottom of Scapa Flow, as the war ends as it would have anyway. Though on the upside, the Royal Navy no longer has to deal with an egotist covering his own faults as First Sea Lord in the aftermath of the war. Now, is this at all an accurate scenario? Honestly, likely not. This is, after all, the best case scenario I can imagine for the Germans, based on research of the forces engaged and the maneuvers of each fleet. It's rather telling that even in this scenario, the Germans just can't win the war, at least not at sea. And that is the end of this scenario. As a mini-scenario, not enough changes are here to justify another video. The Germans ha lose a little bit less ships, but that doesn't really change their history much. Still, I hope you enjoyed the video, and don't worry. I have plans for longer form scenarios, including multi-parters, as well. Thank you for watching, and please like and subscribe if you enjoy the content.